Amen. Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, what I want to talk about today is the body working together. And I, I really want to culminate in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, people kind of miss the message that's been flowing through Corinthians ever since 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And no question about the fact that if you if you go chapter by chapter by chapter in Corinthians, that church had a lot of problems. <laughs> they did. Uh, but, you know, honestly, as I, as I read over the book again, um, in preparation for this teaching, what I, and th this has never really hit me like this before. So this has, I think it really comes out of the spirit that a lot of their problems were they simply didn't like each other. <laughs> I mean, really, they just, they just had problems uh, of unity and they chose sides, and then they picked at each other, and they sued each other, and they judged each other. And it's like, man, you know, when you look at where Corinth is on the map, and how it's kind of compacted together there uh, at the Isthmus of Corinth, and the, just the way the city is set. Uh, and then, of course, it, it doesn't help that the city was... Um, Kind of well, not even kind of. The city was a party city, and it was a, an overly sexed city, kind of like Las Vegas, you know. And then they start that, that campaign: "What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas." That probably had something like that in Latin about Corinth. Um, there were so many, uh, there were so many prostitutes and so much sex available in Corinth that the common street name in the Greco-Roman world for a prostitute was a Corinthian girl. So, so Corinth had a lot of problems, but like I say, uh, because people came from such different backgrounds and, and um, Corinth, that reminds me. So Corinth was a great emporium because you could cut off so many miles of dangerous sea travel by going across the Isthmus of Corinth. So as a result, it had people from all over the world, truckloads of different backgrounds, which then different ways of doing things, different languages, different religious beliefs before they became a Christian. And all that then kind of puts pressure on them fighting for unity. So we start out and we'll see this kind of lack of unity as we go chapter uh, after chapter through Corinthians. So we start out in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and after a brief introduction, the first nine verses, he opens up by saying, verse 10, now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he's bringing in the big guns right away, you know, and, and by the name of Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be made complete by having the same mind and the same judgment. Now, that's not going to come about naturally. That's going to come about as people respect each other, are curious about each other, and talk things out. And, and also, it helps if we understand the difference between orthodoxy and orthopraxy, because orthodoxy is what you believe. And it's very rare that two Christians believe the same thing. They're just the, the, the scripture can be interpreted in a number of different ways. People have different backgrounds, different experiences, that kind of thing. But we can all agree on orthopraxy the practice of Christianity. How do we treat each other? We're loving, we're kind, we're gentle, we're respectful. We feed the hungry, we clothe the naked, we house the, the, the homeless, we, we help out where we can. You know, it's, it's just um, the practice of Christianity brings people together. And then when you realize that Christians are doing the same thing, um, and I'm just reminded of a story now that I heard some time ago uh, back with the Iraqi wars and all that stuff when um, there was a Muslim class. And I, I think if I either got this out of Charisma magazine or Christianity Today magazine, one of those two, I, I'm pretty confident. I hope I'm not wrong, but I'm pretty confident. But anyway, there was a, a Muslim school class with little school children. And the teacher asked the, 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 the class, um, who's the best Muslim? And this little girl spoke up and said, the Christians. 
And the, the teacher about fell over backwards. And she said, why would you say that? And she said, because the Muslims killed my parents, but the Christians brought me shoes. <laughs> God. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, if we, if we focus, I mean, that's, and actually it's such a great temptation to, 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 put yourself completely into orthopraxy that you can completely forget about orthodoxy and say it doesn't really matter. But actually it does. You go to Timothy, what does God want? God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. It's a lot harder to come to a knowledge of the truth, especially if you're going to agree with others than it is to be saved. So here in 1 Corinthians 1.10, you know, he's saying, I want you to speak the same thing, not be divided. You may be complete by having the same mind and the same judgment. What makes you complete then? You're complete as a church. You know you're there to help each other, support each other, bless each other. You can set small differences aside. And then he says, verse 11, for I've been informed about you, my brothers and sisters. Now, Paul is writing to Corinth, but he's not in Corinth. He'd been in Corinth, but he's not there now. For he says, I've been informed about you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's followers, which means that some of Chloe's fathers had to, followers had to get on a boat and go see Paul with this stuff. He says, I've been informed by Chloe's followers that there are quarrels among you. Verse 12, what I mean is this. Each one of you says, I am of Paul, but I have Apollos, but I have Cephas, but I have Christ. Um, and when they say that, what you have to ask yourself is that what they're not doing here is announcing who got them born again. What they are doing here is talking about whose doctrinal nuances they follow. Because if you, if you listen to the teachers, even within our ministry, they have different giftings, different focuses, that kind of thing. And somebody says, well, you know, I really like the way Paul teaches, and I like what he taught about freedom in Christ. And I like, somebody else says, well, I like Apollos, and I like the fact that he anchored everything in the Old Testament law, and he made everything solid, and you knew exactly what to do. And somebody says, you know, well, I like Peter, because he was a good Jew, and he talked about it, and he wasn't, you know, and so, <laughs> I mean, so they're, they're not arguing about the people, is they're arguing about about what the people the, the doctrine of those people are and then paul comes in you know has christ been divided up was paul crucified for you were you baptized into the name of paul and so paul is going to go against this division and try to get people thinking properly so we go forward to chapter three and, and we'll hop through some chapters here and we'll see the same kind of thing now we know that paul was in corinth apollos was in corinth so that's where in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you get the I'm of Paul, I am of Apollos. Now, so here Paul is going to, and I love this because how do you get to the bottom of something like this? You go right at the argument. You know, so many times we're just so such cowards about personal confrontation and stuff. And I love the example of Paul here that he goes right for the problem. What was the problem? Paul had been to Corinth, Apollos had been to Corinth. So people broke up. And Paul is like, you got to be freaking kidding me, really? Verse 4 of, of chapter 3, for when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Paulus, are you not being merely human? Come on, what are your values, he's saying. Verse 5, who then is Apollos, and who is Paul? Who are we? Well, we're servants. That's who we are. <laughs> we're not you know, up on the top of some pillar somewhere to be worshipped. We're servants. We're servants of God. We're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all we are as servants. We're servants through whom you believed. And each serving as the Lord gave to him, I'm serving as the Lord gave to me. Paulus is serving as the Lord gave to him. <laughs> neither, neither one of us, we're both astounded that there's division over this. <laughs> it's just, this should not have happened. He says in verse six, I planted a palace water, but come on, guys, it's God who gave the increase. So then, and I love the um, humility in this. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything because we can't really, you know, we can't give the increase on our own. I can plant all I want to. I can water all I want to. If God's not in there giving the increase, it isn't going to happen. <laughs> God's the one that gets the glory. The only one who's giving the, in, the only one, uh, but only the one who's giving the increase, God. And uh, and then he says, verse verse eight, now the one who plants, that's Paul, the one who waters, that's Apollos, are one. You know, we're just, we're one in purpose. 
but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. That's right. I'm going to be rewarded. Apollos is going to be rewarded. And you Corinthians would be rewarded too if you get on the right bandwagon. <laughs> so let's go over to chapter four. So in 1 Corinthians chapter four, continuing the same thing. And again, watching the division that's developing here in verse three, um, Paul writes, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you. Wait a minute, why would he write that? What's going on there? The Corinthians are judging Paul. It's like, really, really? I started your church. I was there for a year and a half. I, I got dragged before Gallio. You got to be kidding me. And, and you're going to judge me? You know, holy smokes. He says, and besides that, it's a small thing that I should be judged by you or by man's day of judgment. In fact, I don't even judge myself. <laughs> you know, and, and so he, he, what he's doing is he's just making a statement. You know, why, why would you go there to judge me? And then verse seven, of course, they don't just judge Paul. They judge each other. And so in verse seven, for who makes you to differ? And what do you have that you didn't receive a gift as a gift? You know, and I thought about that today because, you know, today I had a medical examination. My heartbeat was 58 beats a minute. My blood pressure was fine. My blood circulation was fine. My, I, everything he said, he, he said, I gave you the highest marks I could give you. If I uh, could have given you higher marks, I would have. <laughs> they just aren't on the paper. I just had a really, really good clean bill of health. You know, and I thought about that, you know, I'm 70 years old. I don't have that clean bill for health because I have never eaten chocolate in my life and take my vitamins every day. And I, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a gift of God to me. That's all it is. And to the body of Christ. That's what it is. You know, and, and here's Paul. He's writing to the Corinthians. It's like, who made you differ? You know, what was Mina's prophecy today that each one is unique. Each one is a vital part. Who made us differ? God did <laughs> for his purposes. And what do you have that you didn't receive as a gift? But if you received it, why are, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? You know, you, you, we're, we don't have what we have because we're so grand. So then he goes on, let's go to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And, th and this develops. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is terrible because now they're suing each other. <laughs> and so um, he he talks in verse uh, in First Corinthians six six. He says, "But brother goes to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers." In other words, you know these these Corinthians again. Remember that the Corinth was a a very cosmopolitan area. Loads of people were pouring in from both both the uh, Adriatic Sea and the Aegean Sea coming to Corinth. Uh, very very cosmopolitan. Lots of different beliefs coming together, and so they do things in a different way and, and you know uh, people are human and their problems that come up and then so they they sue each other and they take each other to the roman courts and verse seven paul says actually then it is in general a loss for you that you have lawsuits among yourselves if you think about it unity is important trust in each other is important the ability to look around and see faces and know that if i got sick and i needed to call somebody i've got friends i can call if i if i needed help i've got friends that i could call on you know you start suing each other and that kind of thing the unity in the body just blows up who you know especially in a tough world like the roman world what happens to your support system it falls apart. He says, it's a loss for you. You don't even get it. He's saying, what, you're going to win a little money or something? Good grief. Do you know how that compares to unity in the faith? You know, it's, it's a loss for you that you have lawsuits. Why not rather be wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Let God make up the difference there. So this is, this is how, how far down things have stooped. And then uh, let's go to chapter 8. Because then in chapter eight, we talk about our liberty in Christ, and it comes up with, you know, uh, eating and eating foods offered to idols and that kind of thing. And one of the things that gets pointed out is something that's extremely common in the Christian church, which is some people are stronger in the faith than others. Some people are able to uh, eat more fish with bones and spit out the bones than other people. Um 
And so some people in Corinth were able to eat food sacrificed to idols, not realize an idol is nothing, not thinking anything about it. About it. Some people just just couldn't couldn't let it go. They they couldn't set it down. You know, back when I was an atheist, um, I, and my grandfather, who was a Zen Buddhist, left me some of his Zen books, and one of them had a story in it that I've always uh, loved and kind of held on to. And it's two Zen Buddhist monks, and they're walking down a, a muddy road after a rain, and there's a, a section of the road that got washed out. And basically, it's a little river across the road. And standing there on their side of the road, uh, contemplating this muddy creek is a very, very well-dressed woman. And so as the monks are walking by and they don't mind slogging through the mud, one of the monks just simply grabs her around the waist, picks her up, carries her across the mud river, sits, sets her down, and the two monks continue. About three miles, four miles down the road, the, the other monk looks at him and says, you know, we're not supposed to touch women, uh, women, you know, why did you touch that woman? And the other monk looked at him and said, you're still carrying that woman? I put her down miles ago. <laughs> you know, and that's what happens with stuff. Stuff happens to us and, and we carry it, you know, and somebody sees you eat meat or whatever. A lot of times what happens, we we can lose our sensitivity to how sensitive some other people are. And we need to be aware of that. And of course, what happens then is without even meaning to, we can be a stumbling block. And so um, in verse eight, uh, Paul writes, I'm in 1 Corinthians 8, 8, but food will not bring us close to God. For neither if we do not eat, are we left behind, nor if we eat, do we have an overflow of credit Verse nine, but take care, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to the weak. See, once again, the lack of unity, lack of sensitivity. He's not saying that you don't have the freedom. He's just simply saying, be sensitive to others. Be aware of the, of the desire for unity. Be aware if there's things in your life that you're doing that could be offending others. First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, go forward a couple chapters. And 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 23, very well-known verse, very important verse along the same lines as abusing our liberty or not being sensitive about our liberty. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but not all things build people up. And we've got to be aware of that. Uh, that goes along with, you know, what, what we say and how we behave toward people when we want to build people up. Um, verse 24, no one should seek his own good, but the good of the other person. And again, if we want to build unity, then we've got to begin to develop that attitude. We've got to have that attitude that I'm going to seek your good, not what I want to do. Then we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 then uh, springboards beautifully from what we've seen, because now what we've seen is this lack of uh, lack of unity, uh, lack of care, lack of concern for other people. So, of course, it's going to show up when all these people get together. What happens when you have a meeting and you get together a whole bunch of disunified people? In verse Corinthians 11, verse 17, Paul is giving them instructions and he says, but in giving you this instruction, I do not praise you because you meet together but it results in more harm than good. <laughs> I, I like the NIV's simple translation, your meetings do more harm than good. <laughs> simple, straightforward, that is the meaning of the verse, that when you get together, it results in more harm than good. We have to be careful with that, even in our online fellowships, because sometimes, for example, you know, I... Um, and some of us more than others, but we have deep feelings about politics, about the political party we like, about candidates we like, about something going on in the earth, you know, and, and you can have a new person or a weaker person, and all of a sudden, you know, you launch off into this tirade about how bad, you know, this group is, or that group, or this candidate, or whatever, and and it, it other people that just are like, I, I didn't come here for that. I came, I came here for a Christian meeting. I didn't come here for a, a you know a, a political rally 
and that kind of thing. And sometimes if we're not careful, even this meeting can do more harm to somebody than good. We have to be prayerful in what we say, deliberate about what we say. Doesn't mean we can't express an opinion occasionally, but if we do so, we have to do so kindly and respectfully and not in a sense that I'm right and you're wrong and we're just spouting this out. So he says, you know, your meetings do more harm than good. Still going on today. Many, many meetings of various Christian groups do more harm than good. And then he says, verse 18, for first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are that divisions exist among you. <laughs> of course, that's going all the way back to chapter one. You know, there, there are divisions. Well, where did he hear that? Well, <laughs> the house of Chloe. Hey, when we get the when we get all the, the home fellowships together in Corinth, people are all divided. <laughs> And to some extent, I believe it. He probably says they, they may have exaggerated a little bit, but probably not much. <laughs> Verse 19, for the, for the, and I, this is really interesting because now Paul turns to irony to make his point. Verse 19, for there must be also factions among you so that the approved ones among you become recognized. You know, he's, he's using some irony, some sarcasm here. You know, well, of course you have to have divisions because otherwise who would know who was approved? You know? <laughs> and of course, people are like, well, yeah, it shouldn't work that way, should it? Verse 20, when therefore you assemble together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. Why not? Verse 21, well, in the Lord's Supper, you know, the, the bread was passed around, the cup was passed around, everybody was eating. And he says, you know, when you when you assemble together, it's not the Lord's Supper. By the way, something we should point out here. Remember that the way when they met in places like Corinth, first of all, they they you know they didn't have cell phones where they could contact each other and stuff. And people would have to walk. Generally speaking, almost everybody walked. Only the very wealthy would be able to ride or be carried. Everybody walked. So even if a Christian meeting was four miles away, to you and I, we hop in a car, we go 30 miles an hour, we get there in, what, four minutes or something ridiculous. You know, they, They're going to walk four miles. It's going to take them a couple hours. And so when the church would get together, they would do the bread and the wine. That was just a symbolic remembering of Jesus Christ. Why are we here anyway? We hear about Jesus Christ. As long as we're taking all this time and all this energy to get together, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember him, his broken body, and his shed blood. You and I get together often enough and easily enough because we hop in our car that sometimes we skip that part. But in the ancient world, it was much more common that the meetings were hard to get to. Sometimes even in some situations, especially after Nero's persecution, they were dangerous to get to. So when you got together, you want to make sure you remember Christ, broken body, shed blood. And so that's why this comes up, you know, when he says, when you assemble together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. That was a serious slap in the face. I mean, you can see the Corinthians are, what do you mean it's not the Lord's Supper? Somebody brought the wine, somebody brought the bed, bread. You know, we, we did the wine and bread thing. Yeah, we, we had the, and, and Paul's saying, shut up. The Lord's Supper is unity. And you're doing this to be sacrificial. Christ broke his body because he died. You're eating, you're stuffing your face with bread and not even feeding the hungry. <laughs> Heck, you won't give up your bread, much less your life. Don't tell me it's the Lord's Supper you're eating. You see where Paul's going with this? Because that's that's the emphasis what's going on here. I mean, you can imagine showing up with bread and wine in one of these Christian meetings, and they get a letter from Paul saying, you're not eating the Lord's Supper. They would be like, what? <laughs> but they're missing the heart of it, which is sacrifice. You know, Christ broke his body. He shed his blood. And if we're going to if we're going to do that kind of ceremony, then what we're saying is I'm willing to walk the same path. I'm willing to give up my life. I'm willing to be sacrificial. And, and that's why Christ then uh, goes on, um, you know, in verse 21, you know, in your eating, somebody eats his own supper, and you got one guy in there that's hungry, another guy is drunk for Pete's sake. Uh, and then he says, you know, if you're going to eat like that, you should have houses. You know, do you show contempt for the church of God and put to shame those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you in this? I praise you not. And then Paul goes on to talk about what the Lord's Supper, of course, is really about, which is giving to each other and being sacrificial. That then sets the stage for 1 Corinthians chapter 12, because where are we is we open the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're in a situation where uh, people are not taking care of each other. 
People are not being sacrificial. People are not working together. People are not elevating each other. Some of the people were trying to show that they were approved by doing more and that kind of thing. And what Paul is going to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is he's going to say, look, if you're going to run a Christian meeting, God wants to engineer it so everybody has a part so that you guys recognize that you've got to be sacrificial and you've got to give. You've got to give a little bit and do a little bit and then give way to others who are going to do a little bit and show up with their ministry. And so he, and he's going to bring this, this whole problem that they've had ever since chapter one. And he's going to bring it to focus in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And he says in verse one, and we're just going to read the chapter here. Now concerning spiritual matters, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be ignorant. Verse two, you know that when you were Gentiles, and of course they were Gentiles, and then they got born again, and now they're a church of God. You know that when you were Gentiles, whenever you were being led to idols, those mute things, you were being led astray. And so he's being honest with them and saying, you know, the, the idols that you were led to worship as a Gentile, you were being led astray, and you know that now. Verse three, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking in union with the Spirit of God, says Jesus accursed is accursed, and no one is able to say Jesus is Lord unless in union with the Holy Spirit. And being in union with the Holy Spirit can be a lot of things. I used to think that uh, you can say Jesus is Lord unless you spoke in tongues. I used to believe that and teach that. I don't anymore. It simply says that to be, you say Jesus is Lord, you're in union with the Holy Spirit. You could speak in tongues. You could say it by revelation. You could say it in a prophecy. You could simply be in union with the Spirit in the way that you presented it. But the point is that you're not lying about it and the words aren't cheap. You're not just mouthing it. You know, the, when it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth and the word confess, homo logeo, homo meaning the same and logos meaning word, when your heart and your head say the same thing, then, then you're in a position to confess. If your heart and head aren't in agreement, you're probably lying. So here he says, you know, you, you say Jesus and Lord, you're, you're in union with Holy Spirit. And now he's going to go with, with Spirit, Lord, and God. And the verbiage he uses is very important, comes up later in the chapter. He says, now there are gifts being distributed to people, but it's the same Spirit, the same Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, when Christ descended on high, he gave gifts to people. So we have different gifts inside us. That means we show up in a different way with different thoughts, different ideas. Again, back to Mina's prophecy, each one is unique. Each one is vital. We have different gifts, but we all have the same gift of Holy Spirit. It's just going, to, God's going to work through it into us in different ways. And that becomes really important. So here the same spirit is the same Holy Spirit. Verse five, and there are ministries being distributed. In verse four, it was gifts being distributed. Here it's ministries being distributed to people, yet it's the same Lord. Jesus Christ is the same Lord for all of us, but he's distributing ministries in different ways. That means different people are going to show up differently. And what's important to one person in their ministry is not important or, or vital in another person's ministry. They have a different job assignment in the body of Christ. But it's the same Holy Spirit. It's the same Lord Jesus Christ. And there are energizings being distributed to people. But it's the same God who energizes all of them and all people. So you have God energizing you have the Lord Jesus Christ distributing ministries. You have the, the Holy Spirit, if you will, distributing or energizing or activating gifts uh, inside of, the, of people. And uh, that puts the, the focus on, you know, the, the same Holy Spirit, the same Lord Jesus Christ, the same God. So what are we fighting out over? And then verse seven, now to each one, this would be each person in the body, the manifestation of the spirit, uh, manifestation, phonorosis from the Greek word phos, which is light, the bringing to light of the spirit. Because Holy Spirit is invisible. You can't see it, smell it, hear it, taste it, touch it. But it comes out in evidence when it's manifested, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, uh, message of knowledge, message of wisdom, and so forth, which we'll get to in just a second. 
So the, each one of the, the to each one the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Well, it's not for the common good if your meetings are doing more harm than good. It's for the common good if it's utilized properly. And the purpose was that it was given for the common good because we can get our free will involved in this thing. We can muck it up if we're not careful. But it was designed to be given for the common good, which means we've got to go back earlier in Corinthians where it says we've got to honor other people above ourselves. And so then he goes, um, let's see, verse now verse eight, for to one is given through the spirit a message of wisdom, and to another, alas, a message of knowledge by the same spirit, to a different one trust, and he's going to go down the line, and we will talk about these. When it says, for to one is given, the there's, you know, people, uh, and, and I used to try to do this too, make that, well, for one prophet or whatever. Uh, if you're if you're with the Greek text, you talk to any Greek scholar, you can't do it. This is for one person. And what's the problem? The problem in Corinth was that they weren't honoring one another. There were people who were claiming to be approved that were trying to take over and bully the meeting and that kind of thing. And God says, guys, it's not the way I work. In the body of Christ, in, in any given meeting, remember, we're back to 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17, your meetings do more harm than good. Your meetings, in the context of a meeting, God is going to energize tongues of interpretation in this guy. God is going to energize prophecy in this lady over here. God's going to give this person a word of knowledge so he can help the congregation. God's going to give this person a discerning of spirits so he can help the congregation. Look, God, what God is going to do is he's, he's going to try to affect the unity that he's been trying to get to since chapter 1, verse 10, because everybody's scattered. God says, you want there to be unity? Let me tell you how it's going to happen. I'm going to give from the top down. I'm going to give that guy prophecy, that guy interpretation, that guy a message of wisdom, that guy a miracle in this, in this meeting. And then if you'll listen to me and follow me, you'll see how you all have to work together that there has to be unity if the body of Christ is going to succeed. And that's what's going on here. And that's why it's four to one, four to one, four to one, four to one. It's not saying that if you speak in tongues, that's the only manifestation you can operate. Of course, we know that's not true because 1 Corinthians 14, 5 says, no, I want all of you to speak in tongues. And if we were all speaking in tongues and we could each do just one manifestation, that'd be the end would say, now the manifestation, i.e. speaking in tongues, is given to everyone, <laughs> but it's not. You know, I mean, just even the message of knowledge, what is it? It's talking to God. To tell somebody that they only get one manifestation, if they prophesy in a meeting, then you're saying, well, God won't talk to you because you only get one manifestation. So if you only get one manifestation and you just did prophecy, then God's not going to talk to you. <laughs> and that just becomes, I mean, even thinking about it that way just becomes absurd. Besides that, and I love, uh, and thank you, John, for your prophecy this morning, walk in the knowledge I give you on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and I really believe that. Do you guys remember John's prophecy today? Walk in the knowledge I, get, I give you on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, and that's really true. When, when we're firing all, all cylinders, we're out there, when we're witnessing, when we're in a tough situation where people are throwing questions at us and somebody's eternal life is on the line about whether we can reach their heart or not, you better believe God is much more interested in getting them saved than we are, and we're really interested in it. So, of course, there's revelation and ideas and illustrations and stuff coming, you know, on a minute by minute basis, pow, pow, pow. We might be led to speak in tongues and say, let me show you what the power of God is. We might be led to give a word of prophecy over them. And then all of a sudden you're operating word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophecy, tongues with interpretations. You pray for the guy and he gets healed. You're doing miracles and healings. I mean, you're putting seven, eight manifestations into one little package that happens in a 15 minute time period because you're witnessing to somebody. You know, this, this is just amazing stuff. But in a meeting, God's going to say, guys, I want you to see how you have to work together. So here's the way it's going to work. I'm going to give this guy a message of wisdom. I'm going to give this person over here a message of knowledge. I'm going to give this person over here the chance to work a miracle in this meeting. And I'm going to show you how the body needs, needs each other. And so that's what he's doing. So he says, for the one is given through the spirit, a message of wisdom. And to another, a loss, meaning another of the same kind, a message of knowledge by means of the same spirit. To a different one, heteros. Now, 
Alas and heteros in the Greek language have different meanings in different contexts. And you can sort this out in any really good quality Greek lexicon. Like if you go to the BDAG Greek English lexicon and you look up alas and heteros and they give you a list of meanings and, and that kind of stuff. But what um, is really brought out well in the international critical commentary is the fact that in a list, when they've got a list of things and they want you to know that there's categories within the list, they would separate the categories by the word heteros because it would be the same, the same, oops, here comes a different one. And then that would carry and it would be the same, the same, the same. And oops, here comes a different category. When we do this and we look at 1 Corinthians 7, uh, verses eight to uh, eight to ten, uh, those those three verses eight, nine, and ten. What we see is that heteros occurs, uh, what two times? Right, heteros occurs two times in verse nine and verse ten, and they broke they break the list into a two five two pattern. So there are two revelation manifestations. We call them revelation manifestations. God doesn't name them, so these are. These are handles that allow us to get a sort of a grip on the situation. It's not God breathed, but we call it revelation manifestations because it's receiving from God a message of knowledge that we need to know or a message of wisdom, what we need to do. And so then, so it goes, uh, the, where to get off to, okay, message of wisdom, message of knowledge in verse eight, and then verse nine to a different one, heteros. And as soon as I see that, I go, okay changing the list, wait a minute, and now we go into the power manifestations, trust by the same spirit, because if God shows you something by word of knowledge, word of wisdom, you bring it into, into concretion by your trust in the revelation that you've got. Like I can just see um, Chuck Swindoll one time did a teaching on Joshua, and, you know, Joshua gets to Jericho, and here's this huge walled cities, you know, city walls, 35, 40 feet high, 20 feet thick, solid rock, you know, and Joshua tells his army, and he says, we're, oh, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to march around the, 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 uh, the city for seven days, and on the seventh day, you guys blow your ram's horns, and the walls are going to fall down. And one of, the, one of the soldiers looks at him and says, that's a really dumb idea. <laughs> because from the flesh, it's a dumb idea. You know, but you get you get word of knowledge, word of wisdom. You need trust to bring that into concretion. Joshua had to trust that when those little ram's horns blew, this gigantic walled city would simply collapse. And he had that trust, and it did. Trust is a power manifestation. Uh, to another of the same kind, gifts of healing, you know, there's power involved in that. Verse 10, to another, energizing of miracles, there's power involved in that. To another, prophecy. Um, and there's power involved in prophecy. And this is um, this is not the kind of prophecy where a lot of times we just kind of put together a nice prophecy, but this is revelation prophecy where we're speaking to things. Take a look at uh, Hosea chapter six, please. Um, this is a great example of this, but uh, Hosea chapter six, and this is God in verse five. Um, well, it, basically Ephraim, you know, Israel and Judah were sinning, verse four, Ephraim, what am I going to do with you? Judah, what am I going to do with you? For your covenant loyalty is like a morning cloud, like the dew that disappears early. You know, your, your loyal to me disappears. Verse five, therefore, I have cut them to pieces by the prophets. I killed them by the words of my mouth for my judgments go forth like the light of dawn. What does he mean when he says I cut them to pieces by my prophets? He would say prophets prophesy against Jerusalem, prophesy against the people of Judah, prophesy against the people of Israel. And then these prophecies would, would come to pass riding on that spiritual power of that spoken word. And uh, if you want to see a zillion examples for this, uh, just get the get the REV, go to your search function, search for uh, match these words and just uh, prophesy against. I was amazed. There's all these examples of, of people, of, of different prophets prophesying against. Why? Because God needed certain things to happen. And those prophetic words were powerful. Prophecy is a power manifestation. And then uh, back to verse 10, uh, after uh, energizing of miracles and prophecy to another discerning of spirits. 
and discerning of spirits is again a power manifestation. Um, talking about the manifestation of discerning of spirits is a teaching all of its own, because first of all, discerning can have two primary meanings. One is what you and I know as discernment, which is making a difference, deciding or seeing a difference in things. So discerning of spirits can be simply, is it this or is it that? I'm seeing a difference. But then the word spirits itself, a spirit can be an angel, a spirit can be a demon, a spirit can be the spirit of God in somebody, and a prophetic word spoken is called a spirit. So when you're discerning spirits, you can be making a distinction. That prophecy I just heard is from God or is not from God. Now, sometimes you can know that by your five senses, depending on what, what came out. But the fact of the matter is sometimes, you know, God will give you a revelation and just say, don't listen to that. That was flesh. Well, that's discerning of spirits. You were discerning a prophecy. But then you also have the meaning of discerning, that is fighting with, because the, the Greek word for discerning can mean to discern, to tell the difference between, and it can also mean to fight with, to go to war with. So, for example, when you're casting a demon out of somebody and God gives you that revelation and you step in and you say, in the name of Jesus Christ, out, and that demon leaves, then, then, you know, you, um, that's, that's the fighting against spirit that is also, by the way, a miracle. So this, the discerning of spirits kind of has like fuzzy edges that gets wrapped into healing and miracles and, and various and other things. Um, I got a kick out of, I was, um, I'll just give you a personal incident. Um, my son and a friend of his were in my house. This is a number of years ago now. And the we were in a, uh, our big house with these big, huge wooden doors, and it was summertime, so we had the doors open, and and there was a one of Sam's friends brought along who had a demon, and the guy started to have convulsions, and I and the Lord showed me it was a demon, and I said to Sam and his friend, okay, you guys have wanted to do this, so cast the demon out in the name of Jesus Christ, and I said, and don't leave it in my house. When you kick it out, tell it to leave. <laughs> And so, you know, and so I forget which one, one of the two of them that went over and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave it, left, leave. And immediately, I mean, within just a half a second or less, the big, huge, heavy wooden back door slammed. And both Sam and his friend jumped about a mile. And I'm like, ah, oh. and I said, well, you told it to leave. And it just, just closed the door on its way out, which is exactly what it did. But the, it's this fighting against the spirits that's, that's part of discerning of spirits. So after reading about then, um, let's see, we got the discerning, yeah, to uh, discerning of spirits. Then it says to a different one, heteros. So now we go to a different category. So now we have category number one, which is uh, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. We have category two, which is trust, miracles, healing, prophecy, discerning of spirits. Then you have heteros. Category number three, tongues and interpretation of tongues. And those are a more direct worship manifestation. As you know, when you speak in tongues, you're speaking the uh, divine words to God. And when you interpret, that's the way it is. It's a, a divine message to, to God or whatever. So that's what's going on there. What, again, what is God doing? He's trying to, to bring unity where since Genesis, I mean, since First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, there's been disunity. And now he's showing people, you've got to work together in this meeting and everybody's going to function in a different way. And then he says, verse 11, now all these are energized. Not back to verse 6, what was the energizing? The energizing was God. Now there are, there are, in verse six, there are energizings being distributed to people, but it's the same God who energizes. Okay, that language is brought down into verse 11. Now all these are energized by the one and same spirit. Then who is that one and same spirit? It's God distributing to each one individually as he purposes. Meaning if you're the one that get the, gets the message to give a prophecy in a meeting, give it. Who gave you that revelation to speak up and give that prophecy? God did, or he's working through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the, the things that you are energized to do in any given meeting, that direction, if you're doing it right, is coming from the Lord. 
and you enter a Christian meeting, you know, prayerfully saying, okay, Lord, how can I contribute today? And, and what really may be on your heart that comes out of the spirit is you just need to pray. And by the way, while you're praying, pray for this and pray for this. Somebody else, boy, I'm really led to speak in tongues and serve. Somebody else, wow, I'm really led to prophesy. Somebody else, like a Dave DeMars, I'm really led to sing this particular song. And then it blesses the body. So it's it's God who's dividing and 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 poking around and, and getting everybody to work in concert so that the whole body of Christ is blessed and everyone can see that there needs to be unity in the body, and then the, the direction it's going to be driving that unity is going to be the spirit of God working through Christ who speaks to us through the gift of Holy Spirit within us. And then you start in verse uh, 12 and Christ and, and Christ and Paul goes right into the body. The body is one. It has many parts and all the parts of the body being many are one body. And so it is with Christ in the last half of the chapter. You're all familiar with that you know, the body of Christ has to work together. It's God, just like God energizes the different manifestations in the different people to bring unity in the body. God placed the members in the body with their particular giftings and talents where he wanted them. And now it's up to us to show up and use that in such a way that it blesses God and blesses each other. So our job as Christians, <laughs> be as unified as we can, Remember, we can all agree on orthopraxy. Uh, we can talk civilly about orthodoxy. Uh, we can be kind to each other and help each other and not judge each other and realize that the Lord is the judge. We can work hard to make sure that our meetings do more good than harm. And we can listen to the Lord as we enter a Christian meeting so that we are participating at the level that God wants us to participate for the unity and the body of that, that time period. So that's what I wanted to share tonight. Thank you for all, all of you for your attention. I really appreciate your being here.